Welcome to Category 5 Technology TV. This is episode number 506 for Wednesday, the 31st of May, 2017. Nice to see you. And tonight, we're going to be continuing our series, two-part series, mind you, on encrypting an external device for our backups, for whatever we want, but it keeps our files private and unaccessible to other people. But tonight, we're going to learn how to make it so that on our computer, our trusted computer, we don't have to enter that password every time. We just plug it in and it works just like normal. So stick around. We're going to learn all about how that works. Sasha Dermatis, what do you got for us tonight? Well, here's what's coming up in the Category 5.TV newsroom. A newfound exploit in Windows NTFS implementation will crash the machine by simply including a short string within an image tag on a website. A French school is using facial recognition to find out when students aren't paying attention. A newfound malware on Android devices could be on your phone. And Intel has already surpassed AMD's Threadripper. Stick around. The full details are coming up later in the show. This is Category 5 Technology TV. Our live recordings are trusted only to solid-state drives by Kingston Technology. Revive your computer with improved performance and reliability over traditional hard drives with Kingston SSDs. Category 5 TV streams live with Telestream Wirecast and Nimble Streamer. Tune in live every week on Roku, Kodi, and other HLS video players. For local showtimes, visit Category5.tv. Category5.tv is a member of the Tech Podcast Network. If it's tech, it's here. Cat5.tv slash TPN and the International Association of Internet Broadcasters. Cat5.tv slash IAIB. Welcome to the show. I'm Robbie Ferguson. Nice to have you here. We've got Sasha Dermatis over here. Hello. Jeff Weston. Hi. And directing tonight, you can't see him, but he's there, Henry Bailey Brown. Hi, Henry. Here in spirit. Hi, guys. Yell loudly. Hi, guys. There Love he is. you. <laughs> hey, we've got a fun show planned for you tonight. First of all, let's get into it. Finally made the step. What? 100% Linux at work. <gasps> really? No I know, way. Right? That is awesome. How there cool you go. It? I know. Uh, so what was holding me back? You know what? Photoshop. Right. Yes. Adobe Photoshop. That was the one thing that I needed a Windows virtual machine for. And so I'd boot it up and I would do my Photoshop and stuff. And the reason for that, as you remember, if you watched the show a couple weeks back, do a little quick search there, um, is Photoshop has really good scaling. Right. Mm -hmm. GIMP traditionally has had very lossy scaling. So when you resize images, they get very blurry. Now, with GIMP 2.9.5, they got it right. Really? It looks fantastic. Good. It works great. I love it. And I uninstalled Adobe Photoshop. Oh, and more. you feel free. Oh, yeah. But more is just a, like, it was like a statement to press that uninstall button. Yeah. And it's like, are you sure? Because then you won't be able to use Photoshop. It's like, Heck yes. yeah, I'm sure. That is, that is fully my intent. <laughs> <laughs> that is what I am here for. So do you friend. still have your Windows VM or is that gone too? No, I still have the Windows VM, but I don't need it. For, for work stuff now. Oh. I mean, we still use it for various things, so don't Cut get me that wrong. cord, man. Yeah, no, Cut you, still, you well. still have it. But I don't, I don't need it in my day-to-day, this-is-what-I-do kind of life. Okay. So I'm strictly just booting up into Linux. Sounds to me like you're holding on to the past. No, come on now. <laughs> yeah, dual booting. I'm dual booting still. <laughs> no, I'm not. No, I'm totally not. So that was a good feeling. That is a huge That's big awesome. deal. This week, we also made a big change to our Patreon page. Right. I uh, don't know if you saw this or not, but if you're a patron, maybe you did. Uh, we've made some tweaks there. Now, I've had this idea kind of cultivating uh, in the back of my mind where... I want to do more than just Category 5 technology TV on Patreon, but I realize right. most of our patronage probably comes from patrons, uh, from Category 5 viewers. Yes. So, from patrons, yes. 100% of our They're patronage on Patreon comes yeah. from patrons. 100%. <laughs> uh, it's true. And so that's why I did the poll a little while ago saying, you know, why are you here? And I think almost everyone said Category 5 technology TV. Right. There right. are a couple that are, uh, that are there for new every day and a couple other shows that we produce here at Category 5. So I was trying to figure out, okay, well, I can't, I can't post new every day and have the patrons build for it and then post Category 5 Technology TV and have them build for it and then post, right. uh, the Pixel Shadow and have them build for it because then all of a sudden you've got this big bill on the weeks where we produce a lot of video. So how do I get our other content onto our Patreon page? Right. 
So, starting uh, last week, I guess, uh, with, our, with our most current show, um, now, once a week, um, once everything has aired, our, patron, our Patreon page will be updated with uh, uh, all of the shows on one post. So it's still oh, just okay. it's still just one billable post per week, right. and that is going to it's going to mainly feature Category Five Technology TV because that's our big show, our flagship, and then it's got the new the Category Five dot TV newsroom. Nice. It okay. does have new every day. It's got the Pixel Shadow when we produce yeah. that, uh, and it also has individual clips from Category Five Tech TV. So, uh, for example, uh. when we do an interview, if you want to share just that interview, you can just grab that one clip. You don't have to share the entire video of the one-hour episode. So, I think that should help right. out a lot. I do welcome your feedback. I'd love to hear from you what you think about the new format. It's just you know it's going to evolve over time, and it's something that I'm, I'm really working on to try to bring right. you more content if you our, if you patron, don't know what the uh, new patrons. format is you become a patreon a patreon patron yes. on patreon patron. i know it's so confusing <laughs> you do that and then you will know what we're talking about well, for what it's worth i noticed the change and i yeah. was like oh it normally doesn't come in like this right it's I usually just it. the one episode yeah i liked it Cheers. it was nice to see more stuff no, and i realize i'm biased but still that's me and all those clips <laughs> well it had nothing to do New with every me day, like, whatever i wasn't on that <laughs> but no i did enjoy it. it was nice to see i was like oh look at that there's a new format yeah, so cool. yeah yeah cool very I think cool it's a good way to get more of our content out there for absolutely. you absolutely and thank you to everyone who has been supporting us it's the last day of the month if you want to throw a little extra in the tip jar to help us with rent tomorrow <sighs> Please do. Uh, you can go to donate.category5.tv. Uh, we've had some additional expenses this week and uh, this month in particular, and uh, some unexpected uh, expenses, as you know. And we are uh, donation supported. Um, the advertising that we have here does uh, support us in, in some ways. Um, and shopping through our partners is a great way to support us as well. You can go to category5.tv, click on support us, and you'll see all the different ways that we have there uh, in order to pitch in. I'm going to do that. I'm going to buy an electric toothbrush. It's going to be amazing. Oh, yeah. And then I will bring it in and show everyone. I won't. You probably don't want to see an unboxing is- of my cool toothbrush. <laughs> well, it's electric. <laughs> so what's special about this toothbrush that you're going to order it online? Well, it's, it's Bluetooth compatible. So uh, you, your toothbrush? Yes. Sorry, what? So you download an app and then your toothbrush gives you feedback on how well you're this doing is like the with your oral hygiene. This like the Fitbit toothbrushes? Yeah. Are you no. kidding me? Come on. No, now. I'm not kidding you. And it's really expensive, so I couldn't do it just as a regular purchase. So it's a, a reward purchase. So I sold my car, and now I've reverted huh. to just biking. Nice. Oh, so congrats. I'm not selling my car for toothbrush. <laughs> that sounds weird. <laughs> my teeth are starting to decay. I've got to do something about this. <laughs> Sell my car. <laughs> so it's my congratulations. Huh. So you'll see that pop up. So this is like, this is Sasha's robotic toothbrush. So do you I even robot- have to get out of bed, or does it do everything just, for you. So jumps on in and brushes my teeth. Is this an effort for you to like send a report to your dentist and say, "No, I'm good. I don't need to come see you." <laughs> my dentist actually suggested and does not get any money for the the recommendation that I get Me one. Too. You do, yes, um, because I brush too aggressively. So this toothbrush will tell you, hey, this slow toothbrush it down, will Sasha. Tur- if I, I set the sensitivity, and if I brush too hard, it shuts it down, and then it gives me like a bad reading <laughs> like on the thing. Like zaps her. <laughs> the, uh, ah, bad you're feedback. too hard. I'm easily shamed, so I don't want bad feedback from my so, toothbrushing. Now, do you brush with your Fitbit hand? Yes. Does that give you steps? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> See, when you said it was Bluetooth, I was thinking it syncs up for music so as you're brushing your teeth <laughs> you've got like music uh, and the, uh, the faster uh, you brush do, do, do. the more you know <laughs> impactful the song is you know so slow brush you got the classical do, 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 do. Going. it'll be like yeah <laughs> do, 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 that's exactly <laughs> <laughs> just wait my teeth are going to be so white and pearly and shiny and clean right, we'll see we'll see okay very good. Anyway, back to the show. <laughs> <laughs> All right, tonight we are looking oh. back at our secure backup drive. Now, I want to reiterate, we use this uh, Kingston Data Traveler USB drive just for the sake of the demonstration. My actual reason for choosing this is because it's only 16 gigs. I'm stuffy, so it's hard to say 16 gigs. <laughs> Allergy season! <laughs> It's only 16 gigs, so it was really, really quick to pull together a, a presentation. We didn't have to wait to format uh, a, a terabyte drive kind of thing. So that's my, my 
reason for choosing it. Um, but you may be using an external hard drive. You may be using something over ESATA. It could even be an internal hard drive that you're, uh, that you're doing this with. It doesn't really matter, but for our demonstration, we're using this USB drive. I just want to be clear that it can be anything as long as it's a partition in your Linux system. So tonight, what we're going to learn, as I promised last week, is how can we now set this up so that it is accessible on our system without having to constantly enter the password. So what it boils down to is, hey, we want to back up our server, for example. Good example for, for, from this perspective. We want to have a drive that we can back up all of our server files to and then unmount it, take it somewhere, put it in a safety deposit box. So if it gets what stolen along the way... do you store way, on your data sticks? Me? A lot of video because of Category 5, Safety right? deposit box? Well, it's just an example. <laughs> Let me do the example thing here, Jeff. So I'm, I put these out and someone's going to go, oh, yeah, that's a good idea. <laughs> because, you know, here's why. Uh, you've got all your family photos on this. You've got them on your computer and you feel confident that, hey, I've got two copies and now if my computer fries, I'm safe. Right. And then the house burns right. down. And you don't ever want that to happen, obviously, but... <laughs> having this somewhere else is a really good plan. Right. right. If it's well away from everything else. So now, so looking at the server uh, idea, if I have a server set up that I want to back this up on my Linux server, that's my backup and it copies all the files over and then I can take it and it's encrypted. So if someone steals it or it gets lost, they can't open the file. So it's still, pers it's still private. Um, but the thing is, is if I plug that back into the server, maybe it doesn't have a monitor. Right. And I can't type the password or I can't do those kinds of things. I want it to automatically mount to that system or at least be able just to go sudo mount dash A and it will mount it and I don't have to manually enter the password every time when connected to that server. But then still have it so that if I eject it from that, take it home, plug it into my home computer, I have to enter the password there. Right. For safety reasons, right? Yep. So tonight we're going to learn how to take this and make it so that we do not have to enter the password on our system. That could be the server, that could be our actual notebook or whatever it is. Jeff, I'm sorry. We are going to have to look at some Luke's dumps tonight. Uh, you know what? I, I think I got it out of my system last week. You got week. it? Yeah. Okay. Yep. You watched back and you laughed hysterically a couple times. Did you show the kids? I showed the kids. Yeah. I Wonderful. showed my wife. I spent time just having giggles to myself. <laughs> <laughs> I watched it like four or five times. I we all did. I yeah. yeah, I showed to get it out of my system because I knew we were going. We were going to be talking time. about. Yeah. You have to like desensitize yourself. I showed yeah. Dave, and he's like, "I need to spend more time on the show. Like, he wants to come watch live now. And every time he comes, I'm so nervous. I never say anything. <laughs> like, <laughs> but yeah, uh, yeah it true, was right? so much fun. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But it's out of my system. We're all good. So that said, if you haven't seen it yet, this is part two, and it is very much part two. If you have not seen part one yet, please go back. Um, I've got the, uh, the link up there if you're watching on YouTube, or of course you can go to our website, category5.tv, and you can uh, watch episode number 505. Make sure you do that first, okay? Otherwise, none of this is going to work. None of it's going to make sense. So okay. what you're saying is this is the episode that's Luke's the continuation. Dump 2? 2.0. Oh. Number 2. Luke's yes. well, number two. Took me a sec. Okay, here we are on my computer. I'm going to plug in the uh, USB flash drive here. And it should ask me for the password. Great, right? I'm going to say forget password immediately because we don't want to have to log out every time here on the air. So I'm going to enter my password. And if it all went well, there we go. No typos tonight, my friends. Okay, so what I want to do is make it so that I no longer have to do that. I don't want to have to enter a password every time I plug it into this computer. So let's see what we can do here. So bring up our terminal. We're doing everything to do with this particular tutorial in our Linux terminal. Cool? So I'm going to create, I'm going to create a uh, super user login by typing sudo su on my, Debian, or on my Ubuntu system. On Debian, it would just be su, as we learned last week. So first of all, if you go into slash root, you see there's nothing in that folder. There might be, I don't care, but I just wanted to show you that there is currently on my system nothing there. I'm going to create something, though. I'm going to actually create a random uh, key file. So it's a, a big, long, crazy binary string that's going to be used as a key, literally, like an actual key to unlock this drive. And we're going to add that to our put key slot. that on the screen? 
I no, hope so. I don't know. Maybe. <laughs> we'll see. Depends on your GUI, but we're doing this in the terminal, Jeff. All right. Yeah. All right. So we're going to create that file. So we're going to go DD. That's like disk destroyer, <laughs> disk duplicator, whatever you're doing with it. It can do both. Uh, in file equals slash dev slash random. Uh, pardon me, dev slash u random, because we want it to be ultra random. Actually does not mean that. It just is a good way to do it. Uh, but a good way to remember, right? Ultra random. It's the better randomness. Okay, so out file. O, pardon me, OF equals. And we're going to go, now I'm in the root folder, but just for the sake of being accurate, slash root, slash, and we're going to call this my USB dot key. Let's just do that. Now we're going to say BS. How much BS do we want this file to have? A whole Let's lot see. of BS. Yeah, we're going to give it a whole lot of BS. That's 1024 is what we're going to do. And then uh, the next count equals four and then hit enter. And what that's going to do is it's actually going to generate uh, 1024 bits of data within this file. Check it out. I'm going to cat it usb.key. It's already created. It was instant. So you see how much gibberish that is? That's actually our key. So good luck remembering it. Uh, good luck typing that in if you're trying to hack into my flash drive. I don't even know how to pronounce those boxes. Yeah, you know. Uh, so that looks like something that you would actually put on the news desk. That's on what, the teleprompter yeah, for you. Yeah, you do you that. Have, she you has to pronounce yeah. that tonight, mm. folks. <laughs> he does things like this. Like, I hope you can get that name. Yeah, that's the name of the, the guy who invented it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so with that key, now we're going, we learned last week at the end of the, uh, of the show that uh, we have, uh, when we create a Luke's dump, right? Crypt setup, Luke's dump, slash dev, slash SD. I'm assuming this is still SDB. Oh, I may have to, I, I unmounted it, so it may be, I may have to unplug it and plug it back in again, because the dev is actually gone. ls dev slash sd star, now sdb1 is there. So, okay, so if I do a Luke's dump, sorry, Jeff. So, like I said, it's set up. It's out of my system. Is it's it? All okay, good. good, good. He's not snickering. But nope. you're holding something in your hand and you're squishing it. No, no, it's... I, I have to <laughs> fidget. I'm a fidgeter, so it's right. my USB. I'm spinning that's, your, that's your fidget spinner. That's it's, your fidget Yeah, it's my... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Script right. setup, Luke's dump. Remember that from last week? I do remember that. <laughs> do you? Capital D. And slash dev slash SDB1. Enter. Okay, so what we learned at the end of this uh, segment last week is that we've got key slot zero. That is the actual password for our device. That's when I plugged it in, it asked me for a password. That's key slot zero. Okay. Key slot one is currently disabled. So what I want to do is I want to actually um, add my key file, which I've just created, usb.key, to key slot one. The way I'm going to do that is crypt setup. Remember, I am super user right now. Luke's add key dev slash sdb1 in my case. It may be different for you. Don't forget that, okay? And then the key file is root slash usb dot key. Enter. This is asking me for my existing password now because guess what? Encryption's not going to let me add a key file that allows me to decrypt the drive if I don't already know the key. Right. Makes right. Sense. Otherwise, where's the security? Someone said um, in, uh, on some forums, he said, uh, I lost my password. Can I add a key file so that I can open the drive? <laughs> well, you lost your password. So how, how secure would it be if that was allowed? Right. right. Because then... There's no security at all. Anyone could just add a key file and boom, they open your drive. Huh. With just a little bit of know-how. So this is a lot more secure than that. Enter your existing password. I only have the one, so that's why any existing password is the password. Right. So now it's actually uploading into the headers of that partition that key file. So now if I do a Luke's dump, you see key slot one is now enabled. So I can now open that drive, decrypt it using either of those two key slots. 
My password is key slot zero, and my key file is key slot one. So those are both now attributed to that drive. I can open it with either or. Okay. So now what I need to do is I need to, you've heard of a UUID, a unique identifier for a drive, a partition. Uh, we need to know the unique identifier for our Luke's partition, our encrypted partition. So the command is a little bit different. It's not BLKID. Instead, what we're going to do is crypt setup Luke's UUID slash dev slash SDB1. And that gives me the uh, unique identifier for this particular drive. So I need to grab that. I'm lucky because I'm, I'm actually in a su sort of a, a pseudo um, terminal window here, so I can actually copy and paste and grab things into my clipboard because I'm going to need that. There are other ways around that if you don't have a clipboard. I'm sure you can figure it out. You can write it down as long as you're very good at typing because uh, <laughs> you're going to need to put it in verbatim. Okay, so now we need to edit our crypt tab. Notice it's a crypt tab, not a FS tab. So we need to first set up that the cryptography decrypts this drive so that FS tab, our file system table, is able to mount it automatically. Okay, so slash etc slash crypt tab, it's, it already exists, so I can just hit tab to, to enter it, but there's nothing in that file. So I need to type. USB, in my case, I'm going to call this, what I'm actually doing there is I'm assigning it the name USB, so that's what this is going to be referred to from now on. Uh, and then the device UUID, so slash dev, slash disk, slash by, dash UUID, just like you'd see in an FS tab. And then I'm going to paste in the UUID that I copied from earlier, and then the location of the key file, so slash root, slash USB dot key. Now notice it's called USB and my device is also called USB. That could be anything I want it to be called. Uh, it's not related at all. Okay. And then at the end of the line, Luke's. And that's, uh, that's all we need. Write it out, control O, and then control X to exit. I could reboot my computer now if I want those changes to take effect to my crypt tab, uh, but I can also just start um, the, uh, the drives as well, and that's going to make it, uh, it's going to make it happen without having to reboot. So crypt setup. Uh, no, it's not crypt setup actually this time. It's crypt disks start uh, USB is what I call this one. Mm, crypt disks underscore start. There we go. Crypt disks underscore start USB. So now USB is in fact started. So if I go, uh, let's just go into uh, CD slash home slash Robbie. That's my home folder. I'm going to make a folder, make dir, and I'm going to call this one uh, USB decrypted just so that you know what it, what it is. Uh, you can call that whatever you want it to be. You might call it backup, for example. So now I'm going to go into that folder. We've learned this command before, but watch what happens. This is a folder on my, dry, on my computer, and it doesn't currently have anything mounted. So if I touch something, now that file exists. So I don't want that to be the case, because if I accidentally write something to that folder while the drive is unplugged and unmounted, it's going to then make it so that it can no longer necessarily access the mount point or I'm going to get confused thinking that it's mounted and it's not because there looks like there's files. Mm -hmm. right. So instead I'm just going to make it so that um, I'm going to remove that test file that I created so the folder is empty and I'm going to go C-H-A-T-T-R plus I dot and the dot represents current folder because that's the folder that I'm in. So it did nothing to the folder but watch what happens if I touch test again. Setting times of test no such file or directory LS there's no file. It made it so that I cannot create files in this folder. Now, once I mount the drive on it, now I'm going to be able to uh, place files on the drive because it's not going to have that chatter. Okay, so let's open our FS tab. This is where things get fun, folks. FS tab, here we go. So now we're going to be using our, our mapper that is called USB. So we don't need to know the, uh, the UUID anymore. That's all done through crypt tab. Um, now what we're going to uh, use is the mapper slash USB. So it's going to be a little bit different here. So we're going to, in our line here, sla um, you can comment if you want, uh, but I'm just going to go slash dev slash mapper slash uh, USB. I keep wanting to type backup because that's usually what I call it. Um, 
and then where I want to mount it. So we're going to go slash home slash Robbie. And this is going to be different for you. USB decrypted, I believe I called it. And then space. EXT3 is, uh, I believe, what we formatted it last week. Uh, EXT3 and EXT4 are interchangeable, so it's not going to hurt anything if I uh, got it wrong between the two. That's OK. And then here's where things get a little bit complex, folks. Defaults. All right, that seems pretty generic. No fail. That one's important to me. The reason is if this drive is not presently mounted to my system and I reboot that system, if I don't have no fail in the mounting line on the FS tab, it's going to keep trying to mount that drive and it's going to hang up the system and it won't be able to boot. It may time out after a thousand minutes or something, but uh, you don't want to have that happen. So no, no fail says, you know what, if, it, if it's not connecting, just move along, folks. Move along. And so that's a good thing to include on the line. Uh, then, uh, comma, RW, because we want it to be readable and writable, comma, user, comma, X dash system D dot device dash timeout equals five. Do you notice that? That works alongside of the no fail as I was explaining. And this says, hey, if it does not connect within five seconds, move on. Thank you very much. And we do not want to scan it. So we're just going to put zero space zero. OK, hit uh, Control-O to write that out. And then hit Control-X. And then type Mount-A, keeping in mind that, again, I'm still super user. So I can just press uh, Mount-A. I don't need to use sudo. And I'm going to hit Enter. This is the moment of truth, folks. Are you ready for it? We need some yes. hunting music here. Here we go. <laughs> Did nothing. Absolutely nothing. No, it did something because there was no error. Okay. Right. I was joking. That was a, that was a joke. <laughs> LS. <laughs> it's nothing. That, thank you. <laughs> I'll be here all night. <laughs> <laughs> Touch. Test. No such file or directory. Okay, so it's not mounted. A mount. Let's see what's happening. Dev slash mapper slash USB mounted as ext3 on Robbie USB decrypted. That looks right. U mount USB decrypted. Let's look at the permissions here. Root root. Okay. Mount dash A. Nothing changed. There we go. I re see what happened there. Notice now there's a lost and found. So now if I go into it, touch test, now it works. And I'll show you why that was. I was in the folder when I typed the mount dash A command. So it's, it's like when something is locked and it can't do anything with it because it's currently in use. So right. I had, I, for the sake of the demonstration, I was in the folder. You won't be when you reboot your system. So that's why it didn't work there. So by going up one folder, doing the mount dash A again, now it worked. So did you notice a couple of things here? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna <laughs> to quiz my, my hosts here. What was different about this time when I mounted it versus the first time tonight? Did you catch it? No. When I plugged in the USB drive the first time, what happened? It asked for a password? Asked for a password. When I typed mount A, what happened? There was no password. No password requirement, go. my friends. Yes to the cheat sheet. Yeah. Do you have a cheat sheet? <laughs> oh, <Nice>. buddy. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so there you have it, folks. So that drive is now all set. So now CD dot dot, U mount, USB decrypted. Now, if I look in there, there's not going to be any test file. Okay, so now I'm going to physically remove the drive. Okay, and we're going to plug it back in to my computer. Error unlocking, that's interesting. I'm, I wasn't sure what was going to happen um, from the GUI perspective. Interesting. So I think the GUI in this particular case kind of messes with the drive. Let's take a look here. Wrong FS type. What did we format it last week? EXT4, maybe? Uh, I'm actually, looking, I'm looking yeah. back. I think it was. EXT3. No, it was EXT3. Was it 3? Yeah. 
So let's just see here. So it doesn't want to mount it in the GUI. Oh, you know what I did? You didn't take a look, Stump? I didn't need to. But what I didn't do is I didn't stop the cryptography on the drive. Oh. And I unplugged it. So we got oh. to think, think in terms of... Now, there's two parts to this. We've got cryptography and we've got um, mounting, like right. as a drive. Right. So what I need to do is crypt disks underscore stop USB... U mount. Okay, so now, uh, now that that's done, I, I'm going to just U mount just in case. I don't think it's mounted. Not mounted. Unplug. I've got it unplugged. I do. Plug it back in. Now. Crypt disks. Oh. 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 I didn't even have to start it. No, it just popped right up. Okay, let's try that again, folks. Eject. I'm just going to eject that. Just going to unmount it, just like a normal USB drive. See, and this is what's fun about a Mac <laughs> show. <laughs> That's funny. There's a password required in order to unmount it. Oh, because it's root, obviously. There we go. Okay, can I... Okay. Cancelled, cancelled, cancelled. All right, let's close everything. There we go. We're back at square... Whoa. Whoa. <laughs> nice. It's always fun having a camera guy. Um, there's, there's the flash drive. Okay. We're going to take this now after our two-part demonstration, and I'm going to plug this in to the computer in three, two, one. It's in. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. There you yes. go. There's my test file. Did not ask for a password. And we're good to go. So now this drive, anything that I put on this drive, now it didn't ask me for a password on my computer, but it's going to ask, if you plug it into your laptop, Sasha, it's going to ask you for it, the password. You're right. not going to be able to open it. Very cool. There you have it, folks. That's uh, awesome. Hope you enjoyed this, uh, this two-part series. Um, this is a great way to protect your data. I always fear, you know, if you're doing backups, if you're keeping private stuff, and it doesn't have to be private. Like, you think about private, and it's, uh, you know, Private. Secret. Secret stuff. Well, no. I Hello, don't, I don't want someone getting their hands on a drive that's full of my family photos. It's kind of creepy. Yeah. Right? Like, it's, it's not that there's anything there. It's that it's kind of creepy. Well, plus, I, I mean, them. you don't want anybody to be just picking up a drive and checking to see what's on it. So you might as well, yeah. you know. And, and this way, I don't have to really worry about mm -hmm. what's on it. Like, it may yeah. have a spreadsheet with some of my passwords in it. It may have a spreadsheet that has some accounting data or something like that. And I just... I feel a lot safer now that my drive is fully encrypted. So it works on my USB flash drive. Perfect. It works on uh, your external USB drive. It works on your internal hard drives. It works on your eSATA uh, removable drive that you're hot swapping. It works on anything that you're going to be storing your data on on Linux. So check it out. This is Category 5 Technology TV. Thanks for tuning in tonight. This, uh, our website is category5.tv. Sasha, can we head over to the newsroom we and find out what you've got for us tonight? Can. Absolutely. All right. Here are the stories we're covering this week in the Category 5.TV newsroom. A newfound exploit in Windows NTFS implementation will crash the machines by simply including a short string within an image on a website. A French school is using facial recognition to find out whether students to find out when students aren't paying attention. A newfound malware on Android devices could be on your phone. And Intel has already surpassed AMD's Threadripper. These stories are coming right up. Don't go anywhere. Jeff Weston. Yaman. You're building a brand new beautiful website. What? Aren't you? No. Am I? Oh, you're a terrible actor. What? This is where acting comes into play. Oh, I didn't know we were acting. You're supposed to act. Okay, fair enough. All right. yeah, I'm building a really cool website. Are you building a really cool website? You need hosting. 
one of the things about a hosting account is you don't want to have limitations put on your website. It's true. How much hard drive space do you have? How many email accounts? How many domains can point to it? Well, we've got an amazing deal for you. For a very limited time, cat5.tv slash dreamhost. For just $5 and a bit of change per month, you are going to get unlimited website hosting, unlimited email accounts on that hosting uh, service. You are also going to receive a free domain name. Ooh. So your own .com. Nice. To put that amazing website that you've been working on it's on true. there. If you run, if you want to build a WordPress site, fine. Sign up. Cat5.tv slash dreamhost. Just don't put Panama Papers on it. Just don't do it. But hey, uh, it's a great deal, folks. Best deal you're going to find. $5 and change per month. Go to cat5.tv slash dreamhost. I'm Sasha Dermatis, and here are the top stories for the week of May 31st, 2017. It's been a bad month for Windows 7 users. The widespread WannaCry ransomware hit a ton of Windows 7 machines, and now a new bug has been discovered that will slow down and crash Windows 7 and Windows 8. The bug allows a malicious website to try and load an image file with the dollar sign and MFT name in the directory path. Windows uses dollar sign MFT for special metadata files that are used by NTFS file system and Windows 7 and Windows 8 fail to handle this directory name correctly. The bug has been tested on a Windows 7 PC with the default Internet Explorer browser. Using the file name c colon slash dollar sign MFT slash 123 in a website image, the test caused the machine to slow down to the point where you have to reboot in order to get it working again. Some machines may even blue screen eventually as the file system locks to that file and all other apps are unable to access files. The strange bug doesn't affect Windows 10 users and it's similar to an old problem in Windows 95 and Windows 98 where references to C colon slash con slash con would crash a machine. The NTFS bug appears to have di been discovered early last week and has been reported to Microsoft. It's not clear when Microsoft will deliver a fix for the problem, but it affects Windows Vista, which is unsupported, Windows 7 and Windows 8 machines. Wow. That's... Do we want to like see how easy it is for someone to compromise yes. this? In like two seconds flat, I'll just show you what we're talking about here. So I'm going to go to our website, category5.tv, all right? So on our website, you see, let's say our logo up at the top here, right? So if I inspect that, you can see that that is image class default logo, and then there's this file, https colon cdn.zechariah.com slash image slash v7, blah, blah, blah. That's our actual logo. So what they're saying is, is by simply replacing that string that is our logo URL with this simple C colon slash dollar sign MFT slash whatever, it will actually bring this system to a halt. Unbelievable that it's just being discovered now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But then again, who would think to do that? Who would think to do it, but now that it's known and not patched... Right. Someone's going to do it open. just to see. Anyone can put that onto a website. It's just an image tag. So right. Sasha was asking, okay, well, do I need to click on it? Do I need to do anything yeah. in order to have that exploit happen? Remember that question? Yeah. And no. The answer is no. It's just like when you go to our website, there's our logo. It shows up. You didn't have to click on it to have it all of a sudden load on the screen. Now, I guess the initial question that most people would think of is, why would you make your website something that crashes people's computers? Because you're malicious? Right. Specifically because you're malicious? Why do websites distribute malware? Well, exactly. But what I'm wondering is could somebody theoretically take this and say, you know what, I'm going to put this code in my image so that nobody can steal my image, and if they do, it crashes their no, it's site. No, not, it's, not it's not part of the image. Mm -hmm. It's in the image tag that tells it where the location of the image file is. I get that, but you couldn't throw that... like Because I know a lot of times you get websites will link to other images. Could you put that in there? You no, because then I guess it would crash from your site too. No, he, oh yeah, you, it would crash your site. You could... Yeah. Someone could hide it through JavaScript. Right. Someone could make it so that a legitimate image becomes this string if the user... Right 
has a certain criteria. They could have it detect if the user is using Windows 7 and they are located in Barrie, Ontario through geolocation, change the logo to this string right. and therefore crash their computer. Right. So they could do that, yeah, hmm. through JavaScript. That would be easy enough. Wild. Hmm. Mm-hmm. It is crazy. Do you have better news for us? I do. Well, oh, it depends on if you're a student. <laughs> <laughs> A business school in Paris will soon begin using artificial intelligence and facial analysis to determine whether students are paying attention in class. The software, called Nestor, will be used in two online classes at the ESG Business School beginning in September. LCA Learning, the company that created Nestor, presented the technology at an event at the United Nations in New York two weeks ago. The idea, according to LCA founder Marcel Sausset is to use the data that Nestor collects to improve the performance of both students and professors. The, s- the software uses the students' webcams to analyze eye movements and facial expressions and determine whether students are paying attention to a video lecture. It then formulates quizzes based on the content covered during moments of inattentiveness. Professors would also be able to identify moments when students' attention waned, which could help to improve their teaching. Okay. Mm -hmm. I was wondering where this was going, and I was thinking, you know, what's to stop them from having it running in the background and just be watching a YouTube video? Right. But then, uh, and what is still to stop them? Because they may be attentive to that, but because it quizzes them. Right. Something you said there is interesting, though. It it quizzes them on the questions that were covered during the moments of unattentiveness. Yes. So very smart. Super sneaky. So if the system, the AI, thinks, oh, they're not paying attention right now, generates a list of questions How smart? Them. How smart is the AI? If you get those dollar store glasses that look like those really big open eyes, could you just nap with your... Considering you can like break into two-factor authentication with a picture. Right. Yeah, I, mean, I guess so. Right? Yeah. Wow, that, I mean, well, that guy's really eyes, attentive. It's watching your eyes, so you've got to... But people would learn. It's like the lie detector test and people who have been trained to overcome it. Mm-hmm. You Couldn't you just like learn to be like right. just thinking about stuff and just... It's like what you're doing right now. But the, the <laughs> first question that comes to my head is, are these tests gradable? And if so, does that then in turn create a legal liability where somebody... I don't even know if that's the intention though, Jeff. No, maybe not. But like, imagine rolling this out at, say, a law school. Sure. And right. they go, so... Right, right, right. But this, We're going to test, test you on this stuff. The test is not... Fail. It's not an examination. No. It is, did, did this lesson sink in right like if i could go back over tonight's episode and quiz you on the things that you you know went like this while it was happening or the kids ran into the room and distracted you and then i quizzed you on that it would be a oh i need to learn that because i it it calls you on it but does it factor in things like 90 percent of what you hear doesn't be get retained i'm sure right yeah yeah I just, I am okay with this in the classroom. I would be really upset if they brought this into the workplace or into my home life. Well, exactly. exactly. (laughs) Husbands everywhere are going, yes, dear. Uh Uh (laughs) (laughs) Don't bring it into the house, folks. Don't bring it in. Really interesting idea, though. I think as an educational tool. Yes. Yeah. Yes. If it's purely for the purposes (laughs) of improving lesson plans or making things more dynamic, I could see that. But But does it factor in or... Like, if a, somebody's know, burying Jeff. their head... I don't know. I don't know. Like, I'm a questions guy. I, I like to question... You need to ask these questions. I, I, I think back to an episode that we did a couple of weeks ago where we looked at the sessions of our web viewer, viewers. Right. The users were on our website, and we actually watched it like a video. And so by doing that, it gave us an opportunity to see, oh, that could be improved on our website. So could we then look back at our, our show... If this was in the educational programming that was being and you could watched, see. and see, oh, Ooh. you know, Henry's, how, Henry's fidgeting right now. So you know, this is uh, whatever I'm, I'm saying is how, really how heartbreaking would that be? Actually, like in, yeah, in when that, you think about it, if you're the teacher, say we could see it, yeah. and you're like, oh, every time I talk, they look away. <laughs> every time I say something, they take a drink. <laughs> it, you know, you've become the drinking game. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Okay. A new malware called Judy is now infecting millions of Android smartphones globally, close on the heels of the WannaCry holding PCs at ransom. 
According to security solutions firm Checkpoint, the malware, Judy, uses infected devices to generate large amounts of fraudulent qu clicks on advertisements generating oh. revenues for the perpetrators behind it. The total spread of the malware campaign on Google Play, Google's official app store, may have reached between 8.5 and 36.5 million users, Checkpoint said in its blog. The auto-clicking adware, Judy, was found on 41 apps developed by a Korean company. However, it wasn't clear which countries have been impacted by the Judy malware. Some of, that, some of the apps that were infected, we discovered, resided on Google Play for several years, but all were recently updated. It's unclear how long the malicious code existed inside the apps, hence the actual spread of the malware remains unknown, it added. After Checkpoint notified Google about this threat, the apps were swiftly removed from the Play Store, said the blog. Well, that's good. <laughs> Intel has unveiled a new X-Series platform, up to 18 cores and 36 threads. AMD announced its new high-end desktop plat platform, HEDT, their 16-core 32-thread thre thread ripper a couple of weeks ago. Now at comp Computex in Taipei, it's Intel's turn to update its HEDT platform, and it is one-upping AMD in the process. The Intel platform, consisting of the new X299 chipset and new X series processors, will go all the way up to 18 cores and 36 threads. The HEDT segment is aimed at gamers, video streamers, and content creators with deep pockets or an insatiable desire, more concurrent with more concurrent threads the mainstream processor segment has to offer. The value pr proposition for this segment is always a little skewed with the chips being as much prestige as much prestige parts as anything else. Straightforward gaming workloads may, may struggle to make full use of the chip's resources, but serious Twitch streamers, for example, can make good use of the extra cores. Software developers are another group that can make good use of, of all those cores. The Skylake X the Skylake X chips will also expand Intel's numbering system. Intel is adding a new i9 branding that slots in above the i7 branding for the high-end processors. Don't worry, there will be some entry-level X chips as well, starting with Intel's i5 line of processors. The 7640X boasts four cores and is under $250. The 8-core, 16-thread Intel chip costs $599, whereas AMD's corresponding part, part is $499. The Intel chip does have twice as many memory channels, so it's not exactly like for like, but we'd expect that you'd be paying at least a little more for an Intel processor and an Intel motherboard than a roughly similar AMD system. Thanks for watching the Category 5.TV Newsroom. Don't forget to like and subscribe for all your tech news with a slight Linux bias. And for more free content, be sure to check out our website. From the Category 5.TV Newsroom, I'm Sasha Dermatis. Thanks, Sasha. This is Category 5 Technology TV, and it's episode number 506. And you'll find our website, category5.tv, great place to find other content that we offer you, and uh, all the past 506 hours of tech-centered video with a slight Linux bias. Make sure you check us out. All right, we've got a couple of messages from viewers. Uh, yes. Jeff, do you want to take the first one for us? Sure. So it's from Old Salt. Hey, Old Salt. And Old Salt asks, hey, Robbie, do you have an antivirus program on your Linux machines? If so, why? And if not, why? I know it's unlikely to get a virus on Linux, but it's not impossible. Is this something Linux users should consider? I do have antivirus on mine just in case. I think it's better to be safe than sorry. Yeah, certainly on my servers, um, I do. Um, and I just use, on, on my servers, I do tend to use, um, oh, why does the name escape me? It's like the, the main antivirus that's available in the, in the repositories. Goodness, it's going <laughs> to haunt me, old salt. <laughs> Linux anti, <laughs> not a vast. <laughs> oh my goodness. 
Uh, Free McAfee. Somebody do. I, I somebody like, tell the chat room. I feel like Come we on, put you on, on the spot. What, Node? Is it Node? Kind of did. No, it's not Clam, Node. Clam, Clam Node AV? Else. Clam, Clam? Clam AV, yeah. Clam AV? Thank you. Who said it? Um, I think it's That was that the, Good Guy 98. Good Guy 98. Well done, sir. I feel like uh, this question... Should not have caught you off guard because we wrote it down. It's in the show. No, no, I just copy and paste and print. That's all I do. Um, So, yeah, Clam AV is what I put on my servers, but that is really just because I am, I don't know if cheap is the word. I'm more like um, frugal, frugal, budget minded. I'll tell you what. Here's the thing, Old Salt. If if on, on my computer, so my desktop computer, which is Linux, I do have um, the ESET product. There's a couple reasons for that. So th- we've got to kind of backtrack a little bit with the whole antivirus argument because five years ago or beyond that, the whole story behind antivirus on Linux, and this is why I still just use Clam IV and stuff on my server because that's it's headless and I don't ever, you know, I'm not sitting in front of it using things. Um, antivirus takes care of viruses. So... Mm-hmm. On Linux, this has been the argument forever, Linux is not susceptible to traditional viruses because Mm -hmm. you're not running as the root user um, in a normal environment. If you are, then you're doing it wrong. Uh, So because of that, to have antivirus is really a protection for your Windows using friends and your Windows computers on your network and things like that. It's a true story. These days, though, Old Salt, the, the fact is is that the whole architecture of online threats has changed. So viruses are not the problem in my eyes on Linux. So yeah, you can put antivirus on it. That's not the problem. Uh, where um, there, are, there are some great products out there. I, I use ESET probably because I'm familiar with it mm-hmm. and it is very, very good um, use. because I sell it. And so you know, and I say that kind of as a disclaimer because they're, you know, they're not a sponsor on the show and, and, um, and I'm not you know, I'm not impartial to it. It's just, that's what I use. It mm-hmm. works really well. And so to explain that, um, it is not just antivirus. And I think we touched on this on the show before, um, and especially in our interview um, a couple weeks back. The, the thing that we need to consider is we need to protect ourselves against other threats, ransomware, exploits, software exploits, or things like when um, a rootkit was um, possible in Linux because there was an exploit in uh, NTFS 3G, like in the file system for Fuse. And so people who had a Windows hard drive in their computer were susceptible to a rootkit. And these kinds of things, are those are software exploits. They're not viruses. Um, things like phishing scams, because users are dumb, and we click on things, and we wow. see a link, and we think it's legit, and we click on it, and we give our password or something Hold on, else. you mean you're not over in England with a broken foot and you need help to get back home? <sighs> I'm not. I, I actually... I, do, I will take your money, though. Uh, can I, no. can I just break this to tell you a, a small thing I did today? Okay, we're going to digress here, Old Salt. Okay, I, di- I did this, but I didn't do this. Okay. Um... <laughs> um all right. So I didn't go all the design. way. Okay, I, I stopped before I went too far. I went a little far, though. So s- I want... Wait for it. Sarah at work says to me, I got this uh, $75 coupon for Shoppers Drug Mart. Nice. I'll forward it to you. So she forwards it to me in Facebook Messenger. Yeah. And I opened it, and it said, we just want to ask you a couple of questions. Yes. The short survey, and then you get your coupon. And oh. then it says, okay, now you click here to share it, and then you'll get your coupon. And then oh. when I went to go click to share, it said you need to log into Facebook. The well, pyramid, I was in Facebook already. The pyramid so, scheme of coupons. Nice call. You were already in Facebook. Why is it asking me for my password? Exactly. So then I just closed it and thought, oh, I hope I didn't already get in trouble, but I didn't do any... So like, did you warn Sarah that she needs to change her password? Yes. Thank you. I said, Sarah, I think you and all of your loved ones are at risk. And the problem with something like a Facebook exploit, that's completely yeah. unrelated to Linux. No, I know, but... The problem with that kind of exploit is that when something is able to compromise your Facebook profile, it's able to then spread to everyone on your friends list. Right. The point to that was how stupid people can be. be- and it's just the fact that I was e- you get easily swayed by things. Sorry, Sarah. No. <laughs> me. Me. I she got people yes, yes, all yes. over oh, going, yeah. me. I just okay, got, okay. I just filled that out. What she are you never saying, tried Sasha? to re- she never tried to redeem the coupon. She okay, just forwarded okay. it to me. I was trying to redeem it. Yeah. <laughs> it was me who was stupid. Absolutely. But 
it's yeah. so true. And I'm sure I'm guilty of it as well. Mm-hmm. I click on ads like crazy because I see deals and I want them. Right. That's just me. Um, so that's the thing, Old Salt. We have to think about protecting ourselves, not against viruses necessarily on our Linux machine. That's a perk of a good security suite like the ESET offering. Uh, I think it's called File Security for Linux, something like that. Um, but that's not the main focus of why we have it. That's not why I have it installed on my desktop computer. Um, it's because it protects against things like phishing scams. It protects against root kits and exploits in other software. Other software, that's the key thing. If I open a PDF file which has an exploit that works its way into uh, a Linux version of the PDF reader, then it will protect me against that. Mm -hmm. That's the whole idea behind a a security suite. So, no, it's not necessarily about antivirus, really, on Linux. It's about the other things that you're protected against. Um, And it does help your Windows users. It'll stop things like, you know, if I get an email that looks legit, if I get that coupon it will stop it so that I don't then forward it on to my friends. Right. It will actually stop it by scanning my email as it's flowing in. That's cool. Hmm. Yeah. So there, there are other protections there that are, that are good. So, very good. Thanks nice. for your question. Can I take the next one? Please, yeah. Awesome. This is from Sandrine Marquis, who has some food for thought for Jeff. Sandrine. Sandrine. All right. So... Um, Jeff, why should we give a shovel to workers when we can use a spoon to create more jobs? Okay, hold on. I think you need to give some background on what this question's about, Sasha. Robots. I feel this is robots. Okay. I it's, feel it's this about is... about RoboCop from last week. Robots are stealing our jobs, folks. This is That's Jeff's ongoing hate for robots. <sighs> All right. So what's going on here, okay. Sash? Okay. Could you read it just like Sandrine? I don't, I don't the know. The French accent at all? French, because it doesn't... I know I can't. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, could, I could try for a She's moment. Try, no. Because it doesn't work like that. If we were listening to you, we should stop using printers and we should hire more secretaries to write everything by hand because printers are stealing jobs. Mm. If we were listening to you... I love how this is written. If we were listening to you, we should stop sending email and send snail mail instead. If we were listening to you, we Hollywood should stop producing movies. Sandrine is from Hollywood. So people would have to go to theaters because DVD, Blu-ray, and streaming services are stealing jobs. Mm. At some point, it is getting ridiculous. Can I just... Okay. Can I just say? Yes. I'm glad I'm not you because Sandrine sounds pissed. (laughs) Actually, I think Sandrine just thinks I'm being unrealistic. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. And and clearly uh, a supporter of technology and the advancement of technology. Which, to be clear... Good points, though. Absolutely. They are good points. I love the advancement of technology. I'm all for the advancement of technology and new things to use and try. And yes, there's going to be an element of changing the face of what we do with technology. I mean, we could have had character sketches of this show and mailed them out to everybody, but we have technology that allows us to produce this video and think the, like just think Sandrine of all the jobs that we have disposed of by having a couple of DSLR cameras, one guy over there and three people over here in a little room that we rent. Right. We don't, don't need yeah. a studio. We don't need no. totally get where you're coming from. But my point was it's it's robots that I struggle with. It's not robotics, Don't it's not struggle technology. With robots, Jeff, they will always win. <laughs> <laughs> but it's it's the idea of like we as a human race we haven't proven that we're responsible enough it's to true. use technology in a way to to properly use it going forward. There's always somebody out there going, "Hey, how can we screw around with technology?" Now we want to take jobs like police and hand them to a robot. Robots can be hacked. I realize that mm-hmm. police can be, you know, bribed Corrupted and all and like there's things that happen. But the point is when it comes to robots replacing human jobs, I don't think as as a human race we're there yet from the trust factor. And that's where I'm coming from where I don't see it. I, is Sandrine's like, point though like thinking about the nanobots and, you know, floating through the Jeffrey's tube. They're tools. Right. Yeah, they're... Now, our bots are not sentient. And our bots are not... They don't have 
minds of their own. That's right. not where we're at technologically. Are they just tools? So like the printer replacing the jobs of a secretary or the car replacing the jobs of the wheel maker. Can we just say enhancing the jobs? Because I feel like nobody loses their job completely. No, no, there are jobs that are lost as a result of technology, but then by making the technology, there's new jobs that come as a right. result of it. Different yeah. jobs. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's, yeah. It's, so now, and, and we had this example, and Sandrine, I'm going to promote to go back over our episodes about 3D printing, because we yes. had this discussion. Yeah. 3D printing will cha- will rock the world, was the name of the episode. You remember Such that? Such a good interview. And we talked about how, okay, so we've got, we've got horse-drawn carriages, and when the automotive, automobile came out, now all of these horse-drawn carriage people, manufacturers and service people, and you know blacksmiths and all of the trades that are associated with these horse-drawn carriages, the people who rear the horses and take care of them, um, those jobs are no longer needed. So were those jobs lost, or now are we manufacturing cars? Are we manufacturing right. the automobile? Are we, you know, mining resources to create gasoline and, and these kinds of things? Mm-hmm. So is it a transition versus a, rep- uh, a cancellation? So right. but along the, that vein, is a robot police officer replacing police officers or transitioning them to a different role? In this case, it Possibly if, a less dangerous one. Well, I'm not going to get shot if I'm in the field when a robot is taking my place. Right, but if you remember this story, this robot is nothing more than a um, service bot, so to speak. Like there's right now, yeah. There's a screen on it, it's directing mm-hmm. people. Like I say, the, they're not sentient. They're not. Yeah, it was. It's very minimal yeah. impact, but it's the idea that you know we could have that interaction. Like yeah. I, I teach my kids. Hey, you know what? If you see a police officer, there's somebody that generally you can trust. Mm-hmm. I realize That's that true. there's some people sure. who like to pull scams yes. out there, but generally, if you see a police officer, yeah, you can if trust something's them. wrong, yeah. if you if you can't find mommy and daddy, and you see a police officer, go talk to them. Right. Yeah. But, absolutely. But if I go up to a, a robot police officer, I don't know. Has the thing been hacked? Is it going right. to give me proper information? I don't like. I struggle with the idea of, in particular, replacing police with robots, even if it's just adding a value-added service, there's a lot of things that come with it that I'm going, I don't think we're there yet. Yeah. I, I don't think as a human race, we've shown enough trust with the technology to make this worthwhile. Mm-hmm. I understand and appreciate your, your fears and judgments on yeah, this. Yeah, I'm, I'm not I just... I get it, I get it. I'm not just, I'm just know, more throwing optimistic, it out there like, think, oh, but... Bad tech. That's not the yeah, point. It's no, exactly. Something like this with the police, I, I yeah. don't think we're there. Right. It's just and like, it's okay, self-driving cars, love the idea of it. I don't think I'm interested in having a fully autonomous Uber fleet next year of self-driving cars. Mm. I don't think we've gotten far enough. Not with ready. The t- that's right. We're not mm. ready for it. There's, there's still bugs that need to be worked out. When that happens, great, sure. Because then there's another element of transitioning work that we right. could deal with, but we're not there yet. And but that's this, where I'm coming but from. But this police bot, this particular one, is not meant to enforce the law. It's meant to enhance the police force by taking on more of the humdrum situations where, where it's like bylaw infractions, right? It's but that's still enforcing the law. And that's so, and part of my comment last week yeah. was bringing up the legalities of it. Does a robot have the legal authority? We're very centered on the police bot right now. But that's where this comment came from. But it could also it could be, be from the robot that makes lasagna. I flip and love mean that. Sasha's grandma? Yeah. Robot grandma? Absolutely. There was and also, there was also the robot in the, in, the, in the hospitals. Oh, so Pepper. You're, I think you're Pepper. Pepper, I think. Yeah. yeah. Sure. But you were concerned. <laughs> I deeply that love all of that these. That robot making a lasagna was going to replace Sasha's grandma. Chefs and but, Sasha's grandma. But he, no, it's what not. I, it's, yeah, it's just, it's, it's not the same. Thank I you, would, Rob. I, like, I'm sorry, you cannot take Gordon Ramsay and replace him with a robot. You, it doesn't have the palate. It might have the tech. Doesn't have the language. Well, that's, that too. But. So that's where I'm coming from with, with the robotics, with the robot end, not robotics, the robot end. Okay. 
because it has to do with the back end problem and the use. I just, I don't think it's, we're it's quite a, there. I think there's two very distinct sides to the argument. Sure, absolutely. I would encourage you, please comment below. Let us know your thoughts. Is Jeff right? Is Sandrine right? Is there some kind of happy uh, medium in between? Is, is this I just. I think we're both right. Maybe it's just, you know, am I, uh, my comment that it's just a tool? It's just something to assist us humans so that I'm not doing backbreaking work when a robot can be doing that for me. I, right. can be, I can be mingling with my guests while the robot makes the dinner. Exactly. Yeah. I love the robot kitchen. Please, please give me one. <laughs> Bring it on. Oh. Uh, we've got one here from Red Effusion Music. And by the way, Sandrine, thank you very much for the message. Uh, Red Effusion Music responded to our episode about Wanna Cry. Right. And says, what's pretty scary about most of the ATMs, in Scotland anyway, is that they run anything from Windows 95, yes, really, Windows 95, what? to Windows 98, and XP embedded. What? I've yeah. personally witnessed, this is Red Effusion Music, I've personally witnessed quite a few of them lock up whilst cashing out. The local new ATM near me uses a Unix-based system, and it is the easiest and fastest machine to use Ever. See, this is good. Ever. That sounds like a good machine. And I remember pulling up to the Royal Bank drive through bank machine, and it was a Windows 98 blue screen of death. This oh. was admittedly several years ago, and our ATMs here in Canada uh, have seemingly been upgraded. They've mm -hmm. done away with envelopes and stuff, so now you pop in your check, and it's some kind of proprietary system. It's probably Windows-driven, uh, embedded OS or something like that, but yeah. you never see it. You don't ever, I've never seen mm -hmm. a BSOD on but one Windows of those systems. Windows 95? Windows 95, that's nuts. That's really old. That Bonkers. is dangerous. Hmm, are ATMs interconnected? <laughs> Mm, is Windows 95 susceptible to malware? Uh, wow. Wowzers. Scary stuff, dude. Yikes. I would suggest keeping your cash in a basket under your bed. Yeah. <laughs> Safer. <laughs> this has been the show, folks. Can you believe time is, is just flying by? But wow. thank you so much for being here. Thanks to Henry for Op and yes. Camera and directing us tonight. That was a bit of an experiment, eh? Did that feel kind of neat? We've got a pretty neat setup, and uh, we've got, like, picture-in-picture picture for Henry so that he can see the different cameras, and, and then I've got foot switches so that I can swap back and forth between different camera shots without having to reach out and distract Sasha <laughs> all the time as I'm going like this. Squirrel? You know what's funny? Yeah. I noticed the uh, subconscious muscle memory, though, but three was I reaching out? You touched the well, screen three-quarters of the show. I had to touch the screen. I have to touch the screen for the computer shot. Okay, fair enough. If I want to bring up the laptop, I have to touch the screen. Okay, that's what it was then. I was like, I only have oh, use the foot pedals, man. I only, I only have three foot pedals, so I've got I've got the main shot, I've got Sasha's shot, and Sasha's news shot. Those what? My, no, Jeff those shot. Are, those are my three pedals. No, he's got this Jeff shot. He can zoom in on you. Did you want to do the prize bin like update? Well, we can absolutely. Um, Henry, our director tonight, wants us to raise um, the point that we have an amazing prize treasure chest that yes. is ready to rock. So we've got all kinds of awesome prizes that we're going to be giving away. And it's a treasure chest. We have uh, a really cool promotion for you. I can't really go into all the details of how it's going to work. But what you need to do is send us an email contest at category5.tv. Let us know what you love about Category 5 Technology TV, how long you've been watching, what is good about it, what, you, uh, what keeps you coming back, those kinds of things. And that's your ballot to participate in this contest. So what do we have? We've got uh, a plug power energy meter, which allows you to monitor the usage of any of your 120 volt um, devices. Mm -hmm. So you plug your fridge into it and it will tell you in one day, it will tell you the, uh, the usage overall in it, like per day. Cool. And it doesn't only do that, it breaks it down by cost. How much is this actually costing you based on kilowatt hour? Right. Helps us to cut down on our expenses by knowing what devices are. That's true. Like the phantom vampiring load. Vampiring our power. Yes. Uh, what else have we got? We've got uh, some collectibles from Category 5. That's here. right. We have We've the photo booth and photo Amazon. Book. Oh, photo book. Close. And photo booth. We have a whole photo booth. <laughs> and Amazon gift cards. Definitely. Yes. Which is so, I mean, hey, if, if you're in a 240 zone, you may not pick the 120 uh, um, measuring thing, but you can pick an Amazon gift card and get yourself something nice. I'm right. excited about the Stickbots green Stick screen. Stickbots. Yeah, the kids love it. That's cool. Man. 
Stop every time we go video. to the store now, uh, and my kids see, they're like, oh, that's the thing that was on Category 5. Right. I so want it. And yes. I'm like, it's Very not your cool. birthday. Be quiet. We've got everything from micro drones to um, to Chipolos, which are a, a, Love tracker, the Chipolo. a tracker device. So yeah. if you lose your wallet a lot, just stick one in your wallet. It's the size of a coin. And then if you lose your wallet, you just bring it up on your, your phone. And uh, you don't bring your wallet up on your phone. You bring the <laughs> app up on your phone, and it will show you on a map where your device right. is where your wallet is and if you lose your phone you can shake your wallet or give it a squish and it'll actually uh ring your your uh phone as well it's very cool so there are all these kinds of things so how does it work you send in your ballot contest at category 5.tv if you win you're going to be able to open that treasure chest and pick which prize you want that's how it works so definitely uh going to be a lot of fun we've got some great things there for you nice i do want to say that the chat room says thank you henry yeah i'm in the chat room Okay. Cheers, man. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Uh, let us know what you think, because we're always looking to improve the show. Uh, this, as I said, was a bit of an experiment with, uh, with having Henry behind camera, because we had uh, Jeff is here tonight, and so um, good opportunity for us to, to play around with, uh, with people all around. Sasha made the suggestion, hey, maybe we do a rotation where Sasha's on camera one week, oh, and, would that be and fun? Robbie's on camera the next. Huh? Huh? So, Unfortunately, you'll have to wait till the summer, because I'm... Oh, not available. oh, so this is it. This is the one episode where we can get extreme close-ups on Robbie's forehead. It's yeah. That's it. Super funny. So you're not here again until... I will not be here for the month of June. So you're here busy. for just the two episodes? Just the two weeks. The two Luke's em- episodes? I was here for both of Luke's dump. And, and Luke's dump too. Then I'm Luke's dumps. It's plural. Luke's dumps. Luke's dumps. I was, Luke's yes, dumps. I was here for Luke's dumps. <laughs> and uh, I, will, I will be gone for the month of June. Okay. No, oh. not, not by choice. Right, right. of course. Yeah, we'll miss you, man. All right, folks. Well, thank you very, very much, and I look forward to seeing you again next week. We're actually going to be looking at that device that is going to show us how uh, how much electricity we are u- using with our Exciting. our stuff in our house. So make sure you check us out next week at Category Five TV. So we'll see you then. Bye. Good night. Bye.